Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this podcast of The Elephant. Um, the Alliance Francaise and Ifra Nairobi, this is the Pan-African Forums. And it is such a delight to be with you again, another evening where we can sit back and chat about Pan-Africanism. It is, um, for those of you who've joined us before, you know that this is an online a set of conversations, amplifying African perspectives on a range of social, economic, and political issues. And we sit down and hear from African intellectuals, and we really want to reflect on the practical meaning of the identity African to the range of challenges that are facing um, the African continent and diaspora. It is such a pleasure to be with you. My name is Mishai uh, Mongola. And I want to really thank our hosts again. This is The Elephant, Ifra Nairobi, and Alliance Frances. This is the fifth of a series of conversations that we've been having. And if you haven't caught any of the conversations before, or you'd like to go back and listen to them again, you can find them either on the Alliance Frances YouTube channel under the playlist, Pan-African Forums, or at The Elephant, where they also, if you search for the Pan-African Forums, you will find them. In the first part of the series, the first four forums, we began our journey into defining Pan-Africanism and we've been reflecting on the history, the experiences, the realities and struggles that have defined Pan-Africanism in different parts of the world and through time. Those conversations have catalyzed others and they've raised a number of questions that people have asked in the chat or even afterwards. And so today we wanted to start the second part of the series where we take a deep dive into some of these questions. Today, we begin with the question on language, an issue that has come up, I think, in practically every forum that we have had, either in actual conversations, in the chat, or in the chat, or in responses sent to us. And honestly and sincerely, I am so honored to hold the space for a conversation between two of perhaps our best known African intellectuals who have invested their lives in thinking about some of these questions. So just um, some housekeeping, I will um, introduce the panel and get you give you a chance to know a little bit of the work that they have been doing and that they continue to do. And then we'll allow the panelists um, to um, talk to us, you know, give us, first of all, they'll speak to us for about 10, 15 minutes each, and just share some of their thoughts coming from the work that they have done. Um, after that, you know, we'll, we'll come back and we'll just have, we'll open it up and have a plenary session where we can ask some questions. Let me encourage you, if you're joining us in the Zoom webinar room, to put your questions on the Q&A so that it's easy for us to identify the questions and so that we can put them to the panelists. But please feel free to do what you've already began doing, which is to speak on the chat. It would be such a pleasure to know who's here, perhaps um, just some comments as they're going on along. Let us think together as we talk together. If you are on YouTube, don't worry, we will be um, we will be also harvesting your comments and bringing them into the webinar. So also, please feel free um, as as you're watching the live stream to also be part of that conversation. I will privilege questions as much as possible, but if there are any comments and you know as we go along, I'll also put that. So let me go straight to introducing the panel at this point, and I'm going to begin with um, Professor. Wangoi Wagoro. Um, she is a professor of practice at um, SOAS in translation studies. She's also a visiting professor at King's College London and the University of South Africa. Um, she has had, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try and say everything that you've done because we would be here for now the rest of the, probably the rest of the, of the, at least first part of this conversation. But she's edited several books. She works as an editor. She is an author in her own right, um, both of nonfiction and, and, and fiction. And she is also a translator. Um, I think actually there's one thing that many people know you for is um, that you are very invested, not only in translating, but in creating and holding the space of translation work. You're the founder of Sidensi, whose mission is to promote, inspire, and develop awareness on the importance of traducteur for the intercultural dialogue and exchange. And anybody who's been to the African Literature Association and has gone into the translation caucus will know that you have been holding the space for that 
conversation to be ongoing for many, many years. Um, I want to invite you in by first of all saying happy Mother Language Week to you. Um, I, I, I was very excited to be the person telling everybody happy Mother Language um, Day on the actual day when it came. And I, I should acknowledge that I only knew that and I only became invested um, in that because you have been so generous in sharing your knowledge. So karibu karibu sana wangoi. Thank you. And Thank you. Because, you know, everybody, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody, I know the first time I saw it, I was just like, what is a professor of practice? What does that mean? And I also, if you could just, just tell us a little bit of some of the work that you do with Sidensi, because um, when we talk about intercultural work, intercultural dialogue, what exactly are you so invested in? Um, thank you, first of all, for having me here for all the organizations. And I'm really, really honored to be here with Professor Bashir. Um, he's a hero of mine. So I'm shaking and I told everybody my teeth were chattering, but I'm going to be very brave because this is very important for me. Um, but yes, that's a great question. Sidensi uh, was formed because I felt that I needed a vehicle through which to talk about translation and the work that I do to people who are not translators. The translators, we talk amongst ourselves all the time, have long conversations. But I wanted particularly to speak to African people about this window that we have of our languages which are living. But we are the last generation, I believe, in the like a 40 year gap where we are bilingual, multilingual in many cases. And the people who are monolingual have died off most of our parents, my mother, for example, is 90, but she's multilingual. So the monolinguals have virtually disappeared off the face of the earth. And we multilinguals are the ones who can harness these languages and rescue them. Because if we don't, in our time, we're going to lose them forever. And all our languages are endangered in this 40 year period that we have, and it's shrinking every day. So that's why I started having the conversations and I have them all over the world and they're the best part of my life but we can talk about that another time. And, and one of the things that you do which I've, I've always found so fascinating because when we started the conversations I remember one of the very first texts that somebody sent me was I hope you're not just going to have academics talking theory I hope you're going to have people who are doing what they do even as they're talking about it so when you when we say you're a professor of practice I know you you do research you teach I've, I've, I've met with you in fact I first met you in the space of the academia but you also spend a lot of your work your time working outside academia with people in policy um, with writers with all sorts of people who are using language um, so when we say you're a professor of practice is that what that is pointing to you know it was an honorary title that I was given and I accepted it happily. I didn't ask too many questions because I'm a theorist in um, translation studies, but I was, it's a real honor for us as translators who practice translation to be given such a title and for people to recognize that translation is intellectual and scholarly work, which requires a lot of time. So I, I was very delighted with the title, um, but also I do work, as you said, in policy, and I think as Africans, all of us do all these other things which we have to do alongside our scholarship. It's not enough to do theory and abstract, you know, wonderful things that we love, but we have to take it out to our communities, both intellectual communities and our everyday communities. And I'm very invested in that. And because languages are alive and everybody understands what language does, it's very easy to talk about translation because it's everywhere. It's in art, it's in music, it's in literature. So it's very easy to engage with people. So I have cross-disciplinary conversations with artists, with musicians, with, you know, uh, archaeologists, whoever wants to talk about translation, I'm going to engage them. So that's what we've been doing with Sidensi. And it's been going for many years and I'm very old now. So <laughs> I want to, you know, hand it over to the next generation. Well, may you be there for many more years to do that work, but we'll come back and talk about the importance of translation, especially when we talk about Pan-Africanism. But before we do that, it is also my pleasure to welcome my teacher, 
um, and a mentor too. Another mentor, I'm really, really blessed in this particular panel. Um, this is um, the philosopher. Um, uh, most of, as he, I think most people would say, oh, the philosopher, Suleiman Bashir Dian, who is a professor of philosophy and French. He is currently chair of the Department of French and Romance Philology at Columbia University with joint appointment in the Department of Philosophy. Um, he is, Professor Bashir is also director of the Institute of African uh, Studies um, at Columbia University. I would be remiss if I didn't say that he also works with, I, I, I don't know somebody who works and teaches and does research with so many institutions at the same time. So I cannot talk about Colombia without saying that um, University of Sheikh Anta Diop in Dakar, Senegal would also own him with all their heart and soul. He works with a number of institutions as a member of Cordestria's executive committee. I would be in trouble if I didn't say that he was president of our scientific committee and continues to be a mentor and um, an inspiration to very many people working in our community. Um, Professor Bashir, um, welcome. I will also note, and I can't go into your very illustrious um, CV of all the things that you've done. You do work in three academies um, simultaneously. Um, I think it's fair to say that you have, I don't know, one foot in Senegal, one foot in the US, and uh, one arm in France, and one arm all over the rest of the world. And it's just a joy to see how you manage all that and do it through being able to work with language. Welcome. Thank you so much, Asante and Karibu. And I, I want to say how happy I am to, to, to be here. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Something you did not say, I may have been your professor and I'm very proud to have been, or your mentor, as you kindly said, but uh, you are also my boss now because you are one of the bosses of, of Codesria. So uh, uh, out of uh, obedience in the first place and then of affection, when you asked me to be part of this panel, I just saluted and say, I will execute. So it's uh, a great pleasure for me to be, to be here. And I want to thank the Institut Francais for having me. Institut Francais and Alliance Francaise are home for me. Uh, and, uh, and it is just a blessing for me to be really on this panel. One huge reason for me to be on this panel also is this opportunity to, to, to share it with, uh, with Wang Lee. Uh, uh, she, she, she just spoke before me because I would have said exactly the same thing and claim her as one of my heroes. I am uh, very much interested in translation. I consider myself a philosopher of translation. So I am very, very attentive, obviously, to the, the wonderful scholarship of Mangi in that, in that field. And I look forward to what she will be saying about translation. In our, in our conversation. I am sure we will, we will share something. I, I am a believer in something that Ngugi Wachongo said, which mm. is that the language of all languages is translation. And basically this is going to be the main point I want to develop in our, in our uh, uh, conversation here about the, the linguistic policy, let's say, of, of Pan-Africanism. Uh, okay, and so what I, I am ready to just plunge in and hear what both of you um, have to say. Before I do that, I'm just curious. Um, the other day we were talking about how so many um, people who work across the continent, many of us, as Wangoi said, we are multilingual. We do not just speak one language. Um, but for many people, we still find ourselves primarily working in one or two languages, you know, and a lot of them, you know, it could be English and French, it, you know, basically the working languages of the African Union, we're working in English, French, Portuguese, uh, maybe Swahili, Arabic, you know, there are several, but many of us um, find it, at most we're working with two languages, out of sheer curiosity. How many languages, Wangoi, do you work in? And which ones are these? I've stopped counting now, but I Swahili a little bit. My my friend and my limu is here, Abdul Latif. So I must acknowledge him for teaching me Kiswahili because I didn't speak Kiswahili until I was an adult. So shame on me. I speak French, which I learned at school and for my degree, and Italian. And of course, I speak my mother tongue, Kikuyu. So those are my main languages that I would lay claim to, but I understand many others. Okay, and, and you have had occasion to do professional work in all of these working with in different contexts. Yes, indeed, I'm very fortunate I have. Okay, 
and um, Mwalimu Bashir. How many languages do you work in? Okay, I, I work in uh, French, obviously, and uh, English, obviously, as well, and Wolof, which is my uh, uh, mother tongue, or let's say my first language. Although French is quite first also in my, in my, in my languages. And then I work with, uh, uh, in, in, with Latin and Greek, and also uh, liturgical Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran and the Arabic of uh, uh, the tradition, philosophical tradition. I am sure my everybody else or who's joining this, whether on Zoom or watching it on YouTube, will agree with me. We couldn't have a better panel to, to take us to begin to catalyze our thoughts and crystallize our thoughts on Pan-Africanism and language. Some of the questions, I'm just going to throw this out to you and then I'm going to perhaps come to you, um, Suleiman Bashir Dianye, and ask you if you could just speak from your heart for 10, 15 minutes on what you think and then do the same with Wangoi. Some of the questions that have come up in some of the um, conversations we've been having is the place of indigenous African languages in conceptualizing, engaging and influencing Pan-Africanism, the need for embracing indigenous African languages, such as Kiswahili, Wolof, Hausa, um, Zulu, um, any language that can come up to your mind as the lingua franca for Pan-Africanism, because it seems when we talk about Pan-Africanism, we seem to use English, French, Portuguese, you know, those, those um, languages that come from outside, that are associated from coming to us from outside. Um, the way language functions to divide Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanists into phone zones. So sometimes it seems that we're only talking to people who speak one of those languages and we're not having conversations with those other Pan-Africanists who may be doing the same work, but doing it in a different language. And then even this question of when we say Pan-Africanism in all the different languages that we say it, are we actually talking about the same thing? Are we conceptualizing it differently? Are we even able um, to translate and really to say that when I say it in English or I say it in Kiswahili, the person who's hearing it in Arabic or who's hearing it in Portuguese is actually hearing and entering into the same conversation. And anywhere you want to take us, of course, translation, both of you have brought up translation, how translation enables us to be able to engage this question of Pan-Africanism. And so I'll ask you, just go ahead. And if you do want to also start by telling me, what does Pan-Africanism mean to you? When you, when you um, even before we talk about language, I would be really grateful. Karibu sana, bienvenue, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Shai, for these questions. And you are absolutely right, uh, insisting that in the first place, we want to make sure that uh, the denotation of the notion of Pan-Africanism is clear for all of us because Pan-Africanism itself has undergone many uh, uh, transformation. It is uh, good to uh, remind us all in the first place that the, the very word, the name of our beloved continent, Africa, is actually indigenous to Africa. Because people would say, well, Africa was the way in which the, the Romans called the continent and then the, the, the Arabs after the contest, conquest started talking about Ifriqiya. It is a good thing because people do not always know it to remember that the name Africa comes from a, a location, a, a place near uh, the, the city of Carthage. And it was the name of a Berber tribe of the place of that Berber tribe, of a goddess of that Berber tribe. And then, then it became the name of uh, the northern part of Africa that the Romans conquered. And then the, 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 the Arabs uh, uh, Arabized it as Ifriqiya. But it is always important to remember that the name is truly ours. Because I have heard uh, uh, a few young people say, well, even the name Africa was not really the name we choose for our continent. Yes, indeed, we did, we did. So it is important to, to, to say that. But then uh, what is Pan-Africanism? It is also good to remember that Pan-Africanism was born outside of the continent. The very project, the idea and the name, the, 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 the word itself, were born out of the continent, which is something that we could have expected. Uh, Africans who had been taken 
from the continent by slavery uh, had probably, once they were there in the so-called new world, a more global sense of the continent as a whole, as the, uh, uh, the, the, the homeland, the continent, rather than uh, uh, particular locations, because there was this uh, erasure of uh, uh, any particular memory that they might have, but then the attraction to the continent. And so Pan-African is being born there and then being continentalized uh, after World War II. Let's remember the names of Marcus Garvey, obviously, of W.E.B. Du Bois, especially W.E.B. Du Bois, who organized all these Pan-African Congresses in many different uh, uh, European places, Manchester, uh, London, uh, Lisbon at one point. And Manchester 1945 was the last one that was organized outside of the African continent. And he sort of transmitted the torch to Kwame Kruma then. And so Pan-Africanism, went from being a diasporic name to being continentalized. And continentalized meant two things. First of all, it became internal to the African continent. And second, it became, it concerned the totality of the continent. Because sometimes when we think Africa, we think sub-Saharan Africa, which is a bad thing to, 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 to consider because we are assuming then that the Sahara was, is a wall separating two worlds, which is not true at all, which has not been true historically. And it is important that we remember that this was not true. Otherwise, we cannot understand the intellectual history of the continent itself. And for example, for regions such as West Africa or the Swahili world where you are, the connections with the larger Islamic world and the intellectual uh, uh, and spiritual tradition of the Islamic world. So it is important to uh, reconstruct, to understand that continentalization meant uh, both internalization of the Pan-African project and also, also the idea that Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan it is going from Cairo to Cape Town and, and to unify the continent in its totality. That did not mean cutting the uh, the, the, the connections and the ties with the diaspora, because as you know, the African Union has acknowledged uh, that uh, the diaspora is the sixth region of Africa, which is a way of recognizing, acknowledging the history of Pan-Africanism. So once we have said this, uh, what kind of uh, linguistic policy should we be uh, thinking about in terms of this uh, open-ended project, continuing project of building uh, 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 the African continent or the United States of Africa. First of all, pluralism. That is the main concept I would like to emphasize here. Pluralism meaning what? Meaning, as you said, and, and, and Wangi reminded uh, us of, of that also, that all African languages should be, uh, again, I would say, languages of science and creation. That is the best way for these languages to flourish and to be maintained. We need to, there are languages that are disappearing, unfortunately. And every language that disappears is a face of the human adventure and the human experience that disappears. We cannot let languages uh, die. And the way in which we are going to have them all flourish is by using them as languages of science and creation. And this is our responsibility uh, um, uh, today. So that's one uh, uh, important point. Pluralism means also that we do not, we should not be having uh, uh, this idea that union necessarily means homogeneity or sharing one single lingua franca. Again, again, uh, 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 union doesn't necessitate, doesn't call for uh, uh, um, actually adopting one language. Let's take an example, Arabization, the failures of Arabization in the Northern part of Africa. Well, I call it failure because it was not just directed against France to, French to say that you are going to Arabize your system of education, et cetera, et cetera. It was also something that happened against the local Berber languages, which mm -hmm. are now claiming and rightly so uh, uh, their, their place and their right to become also, to be also 
language of science and creation. And that means what we learn from that is that we need in within the different nations and at the continental level to believe in pluralism and not in uh, homogenization, which doesn't work. Uh, and I would like to, to propose this theme, and I, I, I am looking at my uh, sister Wangui uh, uh, saying that the curse of Babel is not a curse. Uh, you, you remember the, 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 the myth of Babel, God punishing human beings for their arrogance by just uh, uh, destroying the tower and then confusing their languages so that they will not understand each other anymore. Well, it is not a curse if we know, understand that after Babel, we have translation. And translation is what allows pluralism. So uh, uh, if I want to be uh, uh, very practical and pragmatic to end uh, this uh, uh, quick presentation, I would like to remember us, and this might be a point of discussion, that uh, every single language that became historically African language belongs to Africa. And here I am quoting the Algerian writer Kateb Yassin, who famously said that for him, French is a spoil of war. And I would also like to quote my good sister Elizabeth uh, Bouy, who said that in Africa we have uh, languages of Africa and we have African languages. If we want to have uh, that distinction between languages that are indigenous to the continent, Wolof, uh, Swahili, um, uh, Kenya Rwanda, etc., Zulu, and languages of Africa, which are French, Portuguese, or English. So having a pluralistic policy of languages is to understand that all these languages are ours. We have produced literature in all these languages, we have produced uh, uh, beautiful uh, 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 creations in all those languages and nothing can make them more ours than having invested their languages, th those languages appropriated them and produced great creations in those languages. So uh, uh, to, to, to translate what I'm saying into something very practical, I think that we need still to have for the institution, for our Pan-African institutions, a few lingua franca that would be the languages of Pan-Africanism. Among the lingua franca that we have, French would be one, English would be one, Portuguese would be one, Swahili would be one, Arabic would be one. And then I think we need to add from West Africa to lingua franca, and I call lingua franca these international languages that are, it is not just the, the, the number of people who speak them, but the fact that they are really international, you can see them in, you can uh, hear them in many different African countries. So from West Africa, West Africa, we should probably have Mandeng, mm -hmm. which has many different uh, 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 dialects uh, called here Bambara, called there Sarakole, but it is basically the same language, and Fulani. So if we have these seven languages as the languages of our uh, uh, Pan-African project, I think it would be a good, realistic, pragmatic translation of a pluralistic uh, 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 policy of, uh, of languages. So that's what I wanted to, 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 to put on the table for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. This is why I call you my mwalimu, my teacher, because you've gotten so many different things um, that I want to just immediately pick up and run with the idea of, so let's be pluralistic. What does that mean? Which languages do we pick as a lingua franca? And I know that um, Wangoi is going to even now you know, add to the pot that's already bubbling, and then we can have a really, really amazing meal, which you've already began starting. Thank you so much, Prof. Wangoi, yes, what would you have to say? I have nothing to disagree with, with oh. what Malim has said, so I won't waste time uh, repeating it because it's exactly what I believe. Um, that, uh, be, in fact, beyond that, we are one of the continents that's very far ahead. We are the people who have traveled the most in the world because of all kinds of circumstances. You will find an African in Alaska. You will find an African in the furthest point of Siberia. 
and Australia and everywhere. So we speak world languages and they all belong to us. If we were to translate the works of all the world, we would have the largest number of translations in the world because just of the proliferation of our presence everywhere for good or for bad reasons. So I think I agree entirely that in any case, languages belong to humanity and they belong to, the, to our patronage. We are very rich in Africa. You know, you can, like in Nairobi, you, you know, it's a cosmopolitan city. You find we have uh, Asian people who are indigenous to Kenya. You have people of, um, you know, from the Middle East. And we've had links with other parts of the world, contrary to what many people believe that it's just Europe, that, you know, we are Indian Ocean centered here in East Africa. And on the other side, there's an Atlantic, which was trading and dealing with itself as a Sahara. So those relationships have been our relationships long before the colonial encounter, which is the one that we speak about the most. And our languages are linked from way back from Ethiopia's incursions to Egypt and to the Middle East, and it's all there in the Bible. So I think we must embrace this linguistic plurality and be really proud of our own place and not always see it as a point of oppression. The fact that we've learned these languages, which were previously languages of oppression, it means we can hear conversations which perhaps we are not supposed to hear. Mm. You know, so these are amazing. It's a powerful tool. But one of the things that's been uh, of great concern to me um, around Pan-Africanism, of course, is the exclusion of gender and the exclusion of young people, just because of the way it's framed. And women were always present from those Pan-African meetings that happened, like Amy Garvey. Two Amys were present in the early meetings, but somehow Pan-Africanism, for some strange reason, is um, con conjectured as a kind of male we understand it as some kind of male entity. So um, I must pay tribute to the feminists and the women who are fighting very hard for us to have our presence felt in this Pan-African space. And we're not invisible, but somehow the discourse happens as if Pan-Africanism is a male kind of philosophical space, which it mustn't be uh, if we're going to realize the dreams of um, our founders, because it was about independence for citizens of Africa. And I like this idea of identifying as a Pan-Africanist, as a woman, as a feminist, and some of the values that feminism brings and uh, gendered and uh, inclusive ideas, they bring about another idea of, um, of Pan-Africanism. The ideas of language, to just move to another subject, have been around uh, the African Union from the OAU days in St. Louis, for example, in 19, I can't remember, 75, I think they met and they talked a lot about African culture um, and how they would realize at least the use of um, an African lingua franca and Kiswahili has been coming up very often, but I agree completely with Professor that pluralism is the way forward and our salvation will be translation. And we need to learn our languages just to reassert our humanity. Everybody needs to go back, whether it's their mother tongue, their father tongue, their nation tongue, whatever tongue you want to make yours. It's very important for us to recover from the past, for us to have a place um, where we can pitch ourselves. And um, I've discovered this the hard way because I had to learn to translate into Kikuyu as an adult. And it's a very liberating um, phenomenon to be able to go back in, a, in order to go forward. You know, the bird, the Sankofa bird, and there's so much knowledge that we don't have. As you were saying earlier, Mshai, who can talk about their PhD in their mother tongue, you know, or their nation tongue? Imagine if we tried to even just give back those gifts to our mothers and our grandmothers and our communities. So I've been working into translating back uh, some of my own work and other people's work, like um, I read my mother's poem, which is Professor Misheria Mogo's poem, which she wrote for her mother. I read it to my mother in Kikuyu, and she was very moved. And these are small gestures we can do, but we can also do collective gestures. And it's very easy to do because we speak these French, Italian, all these other lingua francas and our continent. We can get together and play games with these texts. I know like Professor Boris Babaka Diop 
in Senegal has been working in Wolof and it, I know they were translating Matigari into Wolof the last time I looked and we can have these conversations, we can have conversations about what do things mean in Kikuyu. I know Matigari has been translated into, into Portuguese for the Lusophone world and so forth and so on. Um, the other two points, which are policy points that I do want to raise, is that um, the African Vision 2063, Chapter 5, which is the chapter of culture, envisages African languages being languages of um, administration and conducting everyday business. So that's part of Vision 2063. And then there, there is Akalan, which is supposed to be uh, pioneering the roadmap on this, but I think it's up to us all as citizens to ensure that this vision is realized, the whole of Vision 2063, which I think is a wonderful unifying Pan-Africanist vision because it was envisaged by African people, intellectuals, cultural people, everybody was involved in crafting it. And the last thing, which is a policy issue, which is very exciting for me, is the Africa continental free trade area. In itself, it may be problematic, but it creates these pathways of trade. And you know, when people trade across boundaries, across zones, there is no telling what will happen. And it will happen, whether we like it or not, like, you know, Tanzania, Kenya border, Kenya, Uganda border, people are functioning and language is living. It's not something that you can force people to do. And you'll need to know how much you're paying in, you know, Kenya, Rwanda or in, in Twi or in Ga or in Wolof or, you know, whatever language. So I like this idea that there's a free continental free trade area where people can actually trade. And along those paths, I hope culture can happen. I hope human relationships can deepen. And of course, we have our very important place in the world. Everybody is looking to Africa. We are the upcoming new continent. China is here. Inevitably, there are Confucius Institutes everywhere. So it's inevitable that this is the center of the globe. Um, I'll stop there for now, but uh, I like the idea of pluralism. And I'm very keen to ensure that our languages are not lost because that will be a loss of human patrimony if we lose even one language and they're dying every day. Thank you very much. And you've really built on, and I really appreciate, you know, taking us on this question of pluralism, but then also taking us all the way to the policy and the way that people are living these realities already. You know, we often talk about it as if when the border reaches, if that country is primarily speaking another official language, we no longer talk, you know, we can't talk to each other. And the reality, and often what you both said is very true, people are working in all these languages. Um, I was thinking about how so many of us learned Lingala, um, even without meeting a person who speaks Lingala, you know, a real person, through the music. You know, you, you, you sang the songs often enough and after a while you began to make sense of some of it because some words kept repeating again and again and again. But I want to press you on this question, both of you, of, okay, this sounds great in terms of the idea of it, in terms of, yes, all these wonderful things are happening. But when it comes to the idea of Pan-Africanism as a place where we are, it's a liberation struggle. It's a struggle where we, we, we need to work together. We need to come up with practical projects and we've explored some of these in some of the other panels. Um, we, are, we are coming up against huge challenges. Does language um, in a way make it more difficult because it, it means that if I cannot speak any of the other six languages um, that, you know, Prof, when you gave us a list of languages, if all I can speak out of that entire list is only one language, then I will find that I only speak to people. And I find this to be very common that, you know, you, you meet with academics who work in English and we only speak to people who are speaking English. We don't read what people in other languages um, I find Lusophone Africans tend to be able to speak at least two or three more languages. The Anglophones seem to be the most selfish in a way, but we, we, it's very hard to work across these, uh, these barriers. Prof, I want to take you to something I heard you say recently. You made the point about um, the Tower of Babel, and I listened to you in a conversation on that, and then um, you used this phrase, après Bandung traduction, and you talked about um, Bandung conference, 
and the possibilities of that after Bandung and, and the possibilities of translation. I just want to press you on that question. And then I'll come to Wangoi also on the question of policy. Um, is it possible? I mean, is it, you know, realistically, does language become more of a barrier than something that enables us to truly work together across the Pan-African world? Thanks. I mean, you, you raised the fundamental points that we uh, that are very difficult, but we, that we have to address because, as you said, Pan-Africanism is a struggle. We need to build our United States of Africa. Now, let me first come to uh, uh, my 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 uh, uh, that uh, that statement. Après Bandung traduire, Bandung the. Bandung Conference of 1955 is very important, as important as everything that happened in the 20th century. Even if it was not uh, uh, bloody like uh, wars, the, the two main uh, World War Wars, symbolically and on the, uh, from the standpoint of the principle, it was probably one of the most important event of the 20th century, this affirmation that you did not have any more uh, Europe as the location of the universal, and that we were now in a world that was totally decentered, a world where no language, if we, we limit ourselves to the consideration of languages, no language can be can claim to be uh, the language of philosophy, the language of science per excellence, because it is the universal language. All languages are equivalent. And therefore, now, if we want to uh, uh, still meet in some form of universality, the best uh, uh, notion of that universality is our encounters in our different languages. And the name for that is translation. How do we uh, overcome the plurality of our languages uh, uh, now that we admit that they are all equivalent, all of them, as uh, 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 telling the story of, uh, of humanity in their own, with their own voice, and that voice is as valuable as somebody else's voice. So we need to keep the, 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 their plurality because we are enriched by their plurality mm -hmm. because the, this plurality presents all the different faces of uh, the human experience in, in general. We still need to have to come together as a humanity address the challenges that uh, uh, we need to address as humanity. One of them we are right now living in actually because we, we, we are under the, the threat of the pandemic and we know that we have to have a human response, a response of humanity as humanity, universal response to that in terms of how we fight uh, against it, uh, vaccination and so on and so forth. And we know also that we have to come universally as one humanity in order to address the challenge of climate change. All of these need universalism. We do not just uh, understand that pluralism should be meaning relativism, everybody in their own language and in their own way of seeing the world from the standpoint of their language. Languages have to come together, but the way, the only way in which they come together is not by uh, erasing the plurality to adopt one, but through translation. And translation is creative. I mean, uh, uh, Wangi knows this uh, better than everybody else. It is not just transferring a content from a language to another language. It is really a process of creation of the afterlife of the, of the works that you translate. And it is uh, uh, productive and not just reproduction or, or, or a representation. So that is one aspect of, of the conversation. The other aspect of the conversation that you, that you raised, which is also very, very important. Now, inside the continent, what does it, uh, uh, what does it mean to, 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 to consider that we are in a post bandung world? That we need to preserve that richness of, uh, that richness of the plurality of our languages. And we need to protect all of them. And the best way to protect them is to use them and to use them in modern terms. That is to say, make them languages of science, written languages, all of them need to be written and also uh, used as languages of science and languages of creation. And uh, 
we, we, we have the treasure of being naturally multilingual. Our history is such that, yes, all of us speak many different languages in, in, um, in, uh, in, on, on the continent. So we should not be having, for example, this relativistic juxtaposing of languages uh, 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 as a way of looking at their pluralism, but on the contrary, have this tra translational model work in everything that we, that we do. And this is what uh, uh, we, we said, both Wang Di and myself. And again, I'm, I'm very happy that Wangi called attention on, we, we should not be just considering things in their massive uh, aspect. We should be going uh, uh, to the detail of what it means in terms of genders. This wonderful uh, Algerian writer, uh, Asya Jebar, who, who passed away not long ago, wrote, for example, that uh, uh, although she, she is she's Franco-Algerian, uh, uh, knows Arabic, uh, knows the Darija, the, 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 the spoken Arabic of her uh, uh, region, but she said that for some reason, she needed to express herself against a patriarchal society and the best language for her to use in that case was French. This is a way in which uh, uh, French became a very, not just a language she spoke or she mastered, but a language that was intimate and expressive of some form of identity that she would express speaking that language. And she could express something else speaking Arabic. To have available to you, to you many different languages, be able to think from language to language, to adopt one expression that I like. Uh, I work in French with pensée de langue à langue, to think from language to, to language is something very precious because, because uh, expressing yourself in your true identity can be something you for which you need many different languages because identity is not just one massive uh, 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 um, thing, uh, just a, a single, we, we are never, we have, we have hybridity. We are uh, uh, actually, many different languages. We perform many different identities through many different languages. And it is really our treasure in Africa to have this uh, uh, capacity to do so because naturally we are multilingual. This was a very long answer to your question, but your question was so multifaceted that I could just go forever. <laughs> it's a great answer. You know, I was listening and you're saying that I was thinking about how when I was preparing for this and I said, okay, we usually use this convention of first names only, but I'm really struggling to call these two by their first names because um, in my language, I cannot address you, having been my teacher, by your first name. So I must, and I keep putting this word mwalimu, because in my thinking and my language and that identity, I can't just call you Suleiman, right? Which with my Anglophone identity, I can just say Suleiman Wangoi. And every time I say it, I find myself struggling. So that's, that was really coming back to my mind as you were saying. Wangoi, do you want to answer that? Mwalimu Wangoi. <laughs> Would you like to add anything to that or help us think a little bit more about that? I see a couple of questions. I'll be going to those, but yeah, on I that, please. I'm totally satisfied with that answer, but I'll just add a few things for the sake of saying something, is that we now have the advantage of education and culture, mm. technology and media. And one of the things that I've witnessed in my own lifetime, when we started pushing in Kenya, for African languages is the proliferation of the media. You know, young people, the, you know, the professionals have taken this, they didn't wait for institutions to standardize anything and they just got on with it. And this is happening right across Africa. You can see there's pigeon, there's shang, there's so much going on and languages are being born as we sit here speaking about them in scholarly terms, but in the real world, there's sharing going on out there in Nairobi. They've got radios, they've got publications and languages are being born uh, because partly because of media and because of technology. And now there's artificial intelligence which will make our life probably, probably I say in a reserved fashion, probably easier if we engage with it. If we leave it for others to determine our lives, 
of course, we will suffer further. But it's a wonderful opportunity because these technologies can actually harvest very large numbers of words and we can all feed them all these words and they can now regenerate um, sense if they're fed. And I know Google and many other um, uh, institutions have been doing, for example, you can Google nine Kiswahili or in whatever language. So there's that which gives me hope that our languages will live and that the human labor will not be as intense as we may have, um, as we have done. I can see that there's a question here on the teaching of languages uh, and we can come back to it properly, but I think teaching and education, I know the Association of Development and Education in Africa through the inter-ministerial conference agreed that it was very important for children to learn in their mother tongues from the beginning. And I think there's a fear that if you do that, then you're going to balkanize and ethnicize um, language, but it can be fun, especially in multicultural schools, the children can be encouraged. And like we would allow to choose French or German at school, there is no reason why an African child cannot be required to have an option of another African language. I'm always very surprised when I go to West Africa, to Ghana, and I find Ghanaians who speak Swahili. There are people from Cameroon who speak Kiswahili, and I go to Europe and I find Europeans actually teaching Kiswahili. So it's not so impossible. I think it's partly a, 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 an emotional and psychological colonial mindset that we think that will be beset upon by, by ethnic, ethnicity. And the more we learn about each other, the more enjoyable it is, because there's so much to discover. Imagine we have 2,000 languages physically on our continent and all those other world languages to learn. And if we can speak four each, I think Prof can speak more than, than me, then it means that it can be done humanly. And in all of Africa, we are multilingual. The other um, thing that I, I did want to say is the, the, the issue about fundamentalism. And I really like this idea about Astia Jaba writing in French. I'm not totally convinced now because we have to try very hard and bring these global scientific, um, philosophical and otherwise concepts into our languages. And I think it's a challenge that uh, if that's the tool you have for here and now, then that you use that. But as we go forward, I would like to see greater emphasis uh, on us trying to find terminology and build terminology bases collectively. It can be done so that we, we are not groping around still and we don't have these hangovers of coloniality. And I think, and I apologize for those of you who've heard me give this example, we tried a little experiment with the word feminist, like I was translating Michelle's work into my mother tongue. And of course, I'm going to fall against this word. And we were trying to figure out what is the near equivalent concept of feminism? Uh, and we were playing with it in different languages and, and it was fun to do. You know, we're women from all parts of Africa with the Feminist Forum. And we, you know, like I, as I said earlier, we, we said feminism in Kiswahili is harakati uh, za kupigania haki za wanawake. It's a bit long, but that's how language is born, you know? So, but we have to try and, um, and, and, and I think that can be, that can be a tremendous fun. So one of the things that I've noticed, and I really want to air this because it's bothering me, because of these, um, I think they invented masculinities, I would like to call them. They're quite fundamentalist. And some of them are claiming the middle space. While we've done the big battle of winning the war, of the psychological war for bringing our languages back home, there are these assertions about what African culture is. And predominantly it's being presented as patriarchal, sometimes taking us very far back in time. Like you've seen in some other parts of the world, it's possible to step back into time by choice where people are lynched and hanged and so forth and so on. So this is one thing that I'd like to warn against, that these languages are important and wonderful, but they can fall into a trap or being trapped into negative, um, negative aspects which take us very far from our freedom. But the only way we can rescue them is having debates in them when they arise and also coming up with new terminology, mm. which now represents the new ideas. That's what others have done, English and French, that you is not always free. Uh, le, il, were the terms, om, were the terms that were used for people. 
but the women said we are here and we want to be recognized. If a little boy sat in a room till today, um, and there are all these women in that room, that room would be addressed as in the masculine, you see? So there's lots to do in all the languages of the world to get rid of this, but there is always the danger of fundamentalism and essentialism. Thank you very much. And I'm going to come to some of the questions. Before I do that, two things that struck me. First of all, well, a couple. Um, Ongoi, thank you for reminding us that you know technology is enabling us to do translation like never before. I do a scenarios um, future, thinking about the future project. And recently somebody shared a clip of this um, technology where you can speak and you can send your avatar and the avatar will translate as you're thinking and speaking in whatever language you speak into another language with all the correct terminology, picking up your expressions and so on. So that that's being done. But then of course, there's always more work to be done. I'm struck as you spoke also of Sheng and Pidgin and all these new languages that are constantly not only forming, but in flux, which makes it difficult to do what, um, uh, Malibu Bashir said, which is, let's document, let's write them down, because as soon as you write them down, they, they shift. And I'm reminded by something, and I want to say it was, it was Usman Semben, I think when he was talking, um, uh, one of his books, and he's there's a place where he's talking about um, the fact that we can speak in Wolof and the colonizer cannot hear us, but we can speak his language and my our language, right? So I can speak French, I can hear everything they're saying, but when I don't want them to hear me, I, I retreat into my language and they cannot speak. And I thought that was that sometimes language, it is deliberate that for our struggles, we may need to be able to create um, those spaces. I know young people do that. They switch in Sheng. And even though you think you speak Sheng, your Sheng is generational. And so they can speak a Sheng and you think, well, wait, I thought I understood Sheng or one part of Nairobi speaks a different Sheng from another part. Um, before I go to the questions, you've both talked about the nuance that comes and the and just, you know, the wealth that comes with being able to speak in different languages, um, think in different languages, create in different languages, how that makes our thought richer. When we talk about, or you talk about Pan-Africanism, or think about Pan-Africanism in different languages, is there anything that strikes you that when I think in French, or I think in Arabic, or I think in Kikuyu, and I'm thinking about Pan-Africanism, I think about it differently. I know when we had our last panel, uh, one of the panelists, um, Dr. Amzad Bukhari Yabara, talked about that he finds that when he speaks about Pan-Africanism, the concept of Pan-Africanism in French carries a particular nuance and carries, um, there is a way that people will be talking and thinking about um, um, Pan-Africanism in French, in discourse in French, that is different from what he finds is more is common in English. And I wonder if any of you have have had that experience or want to share any thoughts specifically to do with Pan-Africanism and that nuance? Yeah, if I may go first, I like, I like this question very much because I know, for example, in Kenya, uh, there's this idea of uh, African people, you know, and um, independence was articulated in terms of black people, but, you know, black uh, and that's in Kikuyu, I know definitely it was unity of black people. So that's how it's expressed. But it underlying that are notions, for example, of Ubuntu. It's not expressed, but the minute you talked about Umoja, you're immediately going to philosophical frame of all those U words that belong to the Bantu languages. And so philosophically, the orientation was different. Even by the time Kenyatta came to say Harambe, it's because already it's embedded by this idea of oneness, which is already embedded in the um, Ubuntu culture. But I wanted to come to this point, which Professor Bashir has talked about. So I found a, a sneaky way of talking about Ubuntu because he signals uh, to, to, to me the idea of a moving Ubuntu. For example, the pre-apartheid um, Ubuntu and the post-apartheid Ubuntu as a different concept, which means people working together, different people, not the original ones who owned the idea of, of Ubuntu. So um, this idea of Pan-Africanism is therefore not a fixed idea. I'd like us to think of it as an idea which we can keep on reinventing 
because we've had the political, but I don't believe we've yet had a cultural um, Pan-Africanism, which I think is the key. You know, the languages, our songs and dances, and really owning them and embracing them in a way that we haven't done. We sort of have, you know, we all know each other through uh, Bella Kuti and um, Chinua Achebe and Seda Sengo, um, etc. But we need to bring this as a more deliberate action where culture is normalized, African culture is normalized. So um, I think there are different nuances. And I know every time I hear Pan-Africanism in French, I always think about Negritude movement, which is not very present in the English language. Um, uh, so there are, there are nuances and they do mean different things to, to different people. Thank you very much. Morning, Bashir? Yeah, uh, first of all, the, the book you were uh, looking for, Semen Usman's book is Les Bouts de Bois de Dieu, Little Bits yes. of Woods. That's in uh, the, the book in which that is uh, the quote that you, you, you made uh, is coming from. Now about, uh, and also I, I remember that I skipped a very important question that you raised about the division, the way in which Africa is divided into Anglophone, Francophone, etc. It goes even deeper than just mentioning languages. It is really the fact that African scholarship is just a victim of that. It is too much divided. In my own field, when you talk about African philosophy, most of the time, my uh, uh, English speaking brothers and sisters ignore totally what is being written in French. And it is only if our own books written in French in that field are translated in the North, in America or in, in, uh, in, in, in the UK, et cetera, that they can access it and they don't access. So in very practical terms, because you invited us to, to think in practical terms also, the, the struggle for Pan-Africanism is a struggle for uh, good publishing houses on the African continent, whose job it would be to do precisely that, make sure that we come up with, we are not divided by uh, the European languages, but that we are overcoming that division by again, translation, having uh, uh, publishing houses whose job it will be to make sure that uh, there is a circulation. And of course, we need also to know the main languages that we are writing in. And uh, uh, so our Anglophone uh, um, uh, brothers and sisters should be doing the same kind of effort that Francophone do in learning French. And we should be also learning Portuguese and make sure that we are one academia uh, mm -hmm. with other divisions and discussions and controversies that would not be just linguistic. There is no reason why uh, uh, the fact that we uh, sp speak uh, French or English would uh, divide our scholarship in philosophy or in anthropology and other, other fields. Now I come to your question. And yes, if we want to say, if I want to say a Pan-Africanism in, uh, in, uh, in Wolof, I would use probably an expression, uh, the phrase Domo Africa, which means literally the children of Africa. That is how you, you, you express the fact that people would share one same thing, to be the children of. And actually that is also how, how humanity is called, the children of Adam. That's the, the, the usual uh, word of phrase for, for uh, humanity, uh, Domo Adama, the children of, of, of Adam. So, and when you say it in French, obviously, and uh, uh, Wangi is absolutely right. We are in a way trained in such a way that we see Pan-Africanism as this negritude movement because uh, uh, of the, the, the can. And when I talk about Pan-Africanism in, in, in English, probably then Pan-Africanism becomes something uh, more associated to, to, to Krumah, Krumah's uh, 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 fight in my mind. I mean, that is the kind of association of ideas that uh, 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 are triggered by the fact that you move from a language to another one. Mm -hmm. Before you raised the question and asked it, I did not realize what kind of image I evoke in my mind if I say Pan-Africanism or Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. uh, in French, or when I say Domo Adama, Domo Africa, 
in, in, in Wolof. So thank you for asking the question and allowing me to realize uh, what kind of association uh, uh, I, I have with the notion of Pan-Africanism. And that certainly inspires all of us to do what Twango you were saying about taking a concept and then seeing how it translates into different languages, but also why we should learn as many languages that our people speak to be able to communicate with each other. I'm going to go to some of the questions that have come up. Let me start with that question. I'm going to the question of Pidgin, of Sheng, of these Creole languages. Um, Funzo Sidogi, who says, what a fascinating panel and thank you um, too, for, for uh, joining the discussion, even as he thanks us for this discussion. Um, to both of you, to both Professor Wagoro and Bashir Diang, how do you pragmatically balance and push towards the protection, as protection, protection, uh, yeah, that word, protection, uh, I can't say it, of protecting the classical African languages with the splendor of creating and embracing emergent Afropolitan communication systems, for example, the Creole languages, which are forming within the major urban centers throughout the continent. We've touched on this, but I want you to think about this. And also in relation to it, you've just talked about writing and the need for us to write. And um, the, a question has come up or rather a thought has come up on that. Um, Julian Bitek says, Sheng seems to be the language of youth. I remember thinking in the 80s, we were the ones who created it. And as I have just identified Kisheng as generational, what are the challenges of writing in a language that is ever slippery, fluid, ever youthful? And um, for those of you who don't know what Sheng is, um, Sheng is spoken, you'll find it a lot in Nairobi, I think, or in, in actually most, in East Africa, um, where people speak Kiswahili and also speak English. So it, it, it's got a combination of Swahili and English, but then also a number of other languages and also some completely new words that come up and then come, become this fluid generational language as, some, as, as Juliana said, that's always fluid, always changing, even in the moment. So those two questions to both of you. Merci. J'y vais. Oui. Oui. Okay. Oui. Well, I, that's a fantastic question, and it is very important. And I, my answer would be to say that it is again we again we should be having this pluralistic posture. I like the fact that the question uh, opposed or, or or contrasted is is a better word here the classical languages and these fluid uh, uh, languages used by younger generations and uh, uh, changing all the time. We have to remember, and this is uh, uh, something that is connected to translation as well. We have very classical uses of our uh, uh, African languages, even liturgical uses, I would say, coming precisely for the fact that they received translations from uh, 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 religious texts and theological texts. You have a kind of classical uh, uh, Soninke language that usually people use when they are uh, commenting the Quran or, 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 or thinking in theological terms, which is different from the usual Soninke uh, uh, that people would be speaking. Same thing with languages in which the Bible had been translated. Uh, uh, you would have this, uh, uh, this classical use of a very classical language, even almost liturgical, and also a more uh, daily use of the, the, of the language. And Creoles, the, the, the Creoles that are proliferating and being born every single day, especially in our urban spaces, I believe this is uh, something that uh, is a, a natural movement to be expected. Uh, in the future as well. It is happening to French, for example. Mm -hmm. If you take a, a, a country like Cote d'Ivoire, let me take that example. Senegal would be different because Senegal, uh, the lingua franca of Wolof is so present that usually people who speak French would speak a very classical French. While if you, so, because if you, you do not have to speak French, in other words, if you do not speak it well, you do not have to because Wolof, uh, with Wolof you will be understood. While in countries where you have many more languages and no real lingua franca, people are pressured to use French even if they haven't been schooled for a long time. So they make it their own French 
uh, mix it with uh, uh, local words and so on. And French is being creolized very quickly. And so you have a, 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 a Francais de Côte d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. uh, which is again, wonderful in terms of its creativity. And uh, writers are using it uh, also or, or, or playwrights. And again, this is an aspect of this, uh, of this, uh, 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 of this uh, pluralism that is really uh, um, something great for, for, for all of us. So I like the idea of Chang. I wish I could speak Chang. But when I come uh, at last and visit Nairobi, uh, you, will, you will teach me some Chang. I am holding you to that now that you publicly said it. Um, what would you like to add if you wanted to add anything to that? Yes, uh, the two observations that um, I like this idea of the pluralistic posture, uh, but also about the classical languages. Uh, in Africa, some languages are more advanced in their development, either because of the number of users or because of their encounter with coloniality. So you find a language like Zulu, Yoruba, et cetera, they are well developed. Um, and in like Ethiopia and Somalia, the languages are quite well developed. So um, in other languages which were suppressed, there's a huge gap. And I, I'm sure some of you know, I'm going to publish a book called Mind the Gap. And there is a historical gap between the modern Western languages, which have really, like English, grown exponentially because it's predatory, it steals, it borrows, and it's shameless about how it proliferates. Sometimes we're conservative and we want to remain pure. And again, I think as the prof has talked about the influence of the liturgical text, the Bible, the Quran, and so on, have also influenced. So we don't have these pure languages, even the ones that we do speak. Um, I remember um, like, the Bible in the King James Bible, for example, has a huge influence on Kikuyu. So when I was translating, I suddenly found that I've got this iambic pentameter going da 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 da. And I was thinking, oh, where did this come from in Kikuyu? And I suddenly became very self conscious and I started to listen very carefully to how people, especially who were not anglicized, were speaking the language. Uh, our languages are not written, as you are aware, but still. Um, so, for example, Gugi is the main author of Kikuyu literature, and the books are not even 30. So that's a very tiny corpus. And, you know, he's, it's a worldwide, and people think there's this huge corpus of Kikuyu literature. It's not true. So we have to create corpuses. We have to create terminology bases. We have to standardize the languages, even the radio and the television. When you hear you, what people speaking, you're not quite sure what they are saying. We have dialects within our languages, as you know. Um, I think I sent um, Shai something on International uh, Language Day, and they're talking about these two dialects of Kidavida, and I can't remember the, other, the, the name of the other um, dialects. But in Kikuyu, there's so many dialects that you, 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 you I know that I, a person who speaks in Kirinyaga Kikuyu, sometimes I cannot hear what they are saying. I, I'll understand Italian or Greek probably more readily. So we need to standardize the languages if they're going to live by just drawing. Um, I think um, we can do collective work because it's fun. I don't think any one person needs to labor, but we need to create the tools. Um, I know that the tools were created for Kiswahili and that's how it's managed to proliferate um, uh, as much as it can. And of course, using the languages and encouraging people um, to learn the languages but the most important thing for me in terms of the higher level is to professionalize the teachers, to professionalize the translators. So many people are freelancing, which cannot be good because you know, then you need revisers and peer people and a whole community of practice um, across each language and across the languages that are working together. And we need all of us. I've asked everybody, this is my plea, for everybody who speaks two languages to give a gift. Give a gift back to your language. If you can't, even a poem, if you can't give a gift of your own language, give a gift of another language. If you can't speak your language, get somebody who can gift a gift to your language and pay for it either with coffee or tea while they are working or pay them with money. And I can see Professor 
Godwin Morunga is challenging me here to translate Professor Bashir. If it's a challenge, I accept it readily if he is willing. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So I'm just going to make that challenge. That will... I was going to um, leave it to the end, but um, let me, go, go, Dr. Godwin Morunga, who actually was one of our panelists um, earlier. In the second conversation we had, he was one of our guests and he's the executive secretary of Codestria. And he says on the point on translation an offer for Codestria to translate Bashir, uh, Suleiman Bashir Diania's recent memoir into English, it's in French, and says there's no reason why Wangoi shouldn't translate the memoir and Codestria publish it. So we are challenging the two of you to work together on this. But I want to bring you to that question, mm -hmm. Mongoi, that you started us on, which is the question of policy. And you had touched on it a little bit earlier and working in our mother languages. Anjeri Watathi says, thank you for the interesting views. I was just wondering um, what both of you think about having what we called our mother tongue used as the teaching language in schools. Um, and wouldn't this result in, in separation, you know, in, in most, I guess, most of our African countries. And I want to pair that. Um, somebody sent in a message on an Infinix note and said, translation and fidelity syndrome and how the language of power will rupture and dominate the weaker ones in the process of translation um, fascinates me. Am I the only person with these concerns? So both of them are dealing with this thing of, we've got so many languages and some languages are spoken by very many people. Right in Kenya, we talk about the tyranny of numbers. So the the okay, this is a joke. So nobody, please get offended. The tyranny of the people who have quantity, as opposed to the people who have quality. Um, in other words, people the smaller language groups, and always this fear that this some language groups will dominate others because they just don't have the resources, they don't have the numbers. Whether you're teaching in schools or when we're talking about translation. How would both of you talk to, uh, to these policy questions? I love this question because it arises a lot. Languages have nothing to do with numbers as such. Uh, Finnish people are one million people and they're happy in their language. Um, the numbers can count in terms, but Kiswahili will not be more Kiswahili because there are more Kiswahili speakers. What they can do by their numbers is bring their experience. Uh, and uh, so I think people shouldn't be afraid of learning their languages. It's a human right, actually. It's a recognized universal right um, in, the, in the United Nations uh, cultural policy. Everybody has a right to a language. Even the one last living person of a language that's about to die has a right for that language to be recognized and if possible, preserved. So I wouldn't be afraid. I think the things that divide are other things, not the languages. It's the power that's used around ethnicity, negative ethnicity. And pluralism is in fact a richness as we have been saying here all the time. Uh, and then of course, translation is a wonderful tool for teaching. And it's one that I would advocate in Africa because I think we've been talking about speaking across languages, but I don't think that's what we do. We think in technicolor. I don't cross the bridge to go to Kikuyu or Kiswahili. Other people in other countries do that. But in Africa, we, we switch codes all the time so that I can be speaking to Bashir. I can say this Teranga, he can see Habari Yako and Asante. So we are already in technicolor and we mustn't see these divides. We are encouraged by people who are power brokers to think in these divisive terms, but in fact, languages are unifying factors and they will expand our horizons. Those of us who speak, I, I don't want to say many different languages. I think we have a larger expanse of language and vocabulary. That's how I see myself. I've spoken these languages now for so long. I don't see the borders of French, Italian, Kikuyu, Kiswahili, I no longer, and I just switch. If somebody starts speaking French, I'm in there. I don't even feel that I've made the switch. So um, I think we should encourage children to learn their mother tongue as much as possible, uh, or whatever, father tongue or nation tongue, because it's a tongue of emoting. And for me, this power to emote in something that is innate, uh, and close to you, such as close to your mother, 
which is why it's called your mother tongue or your father tongue or your nation tongue. For example, this emoting in Kiswahili. It's so important to us as East Africans that we can emote with others in our language. It's a very wonderful thing. And if you have it from base, kutoka musingi, as one would say, then it becomes your language of emoting. And then if you have that in place, then it's easy then to connect with other languages and culture safely. And we, in this conversation, are able to do so. We take it for granted that we speak Wolof, Kikuyu, Taita, and Kiswahili. We take this for granted, but the next generation cannot take this for granted. They speak in another language and they don't wholly own it. And sometimes those languages contain negative connotations about African people. As I spoke in another conversation, I grew up thinking of Africans as they. When I read the history books, I would find this they to describe Africans. And it's only long after that I started using we in my own writing, we Africans, rather than those Africans, because it's a pejorative anyway. So I think it's a joy, but as I warned, these languages are not innocent and we need to put checks and balances in place so that those negative concepts about ourselves, even in, which have even infiltrated our languages. So we think of ourselves as niggers or as they, that even our own languages, because of the close contact with coloniality, also need to be cleaned up. So we have to make teaching of African languages a conscious act and the teaching of world languages also a conscious act. Mm. Prof, as you make your comment on that, I'm just noting that Jamila um, Bisbas notes that some schools, for example, in Kenya, still publish pupils and students for speaking mother tongue. And so what, what the point that you've just been making, Wangoi, is really, really important, that we have to change that mentality that, you know, these languages, that certain languages are not good enough as opposed to others. Uh, Mwalimu Bashir, do you want to add anything before we come to our final two questions? Yeah, just a, a remark following what you said and, and what Wangi said uh, also about the school, the importance of the school. I agree totally with, uh, for example, something that Munira said earlier about, uh, you know, I, I read in the chat about the fact that uh, uh, schools also have to respect pluralism. I mean, in, in the Arab, in the, in the Maghreb, you would have many different uh, uh, languages. Even in Arabic, you would have many different levels of Arabic. You have the, uh, the Arabic of the Quran that nobody speaks. You have the Arabic that has been reconstructed as classical, which is the Arabic of the press. And you have the Arabic that uh, people speak in the, in the streets, Darija. And, and, and then you have also Berber languages and all these should be treated equally. And it brings me to what you said about the tyranny of, of, of numbers. If I take a country like mine, Senegal, almost everybody speaks Wolof. Uh, Wolof ethnic, the ethnic group of Wolof is a majority, but not the totality. Of course, they are not even 50%, they are 40% or something like that. But the language has become a lingua franca. If you try to impose it, then you would have 60% of the population saying, no, I don't speak it. Mm. No, you don't. You teach everybody in their mother tongue. I believe that uh, experiments have been uh, conducted, experiences have been conducted that show that if a child starts with their mother tongue and then other languages are introduced afterwards, they are going to do well in school. Mm -hmm. And so again, in, in schooling people, you do, do, should be having this pluralistic uh, policy of saying, okay, I'm going to teach in the, in the early classes all the different languages and I'm not looking at the numbers and I'm not trying to impose a language on the basis that it is the language of the majority. This is bad, this is not democracy. This is, the, and this is not efficient at all. Senegal should not be having all its schools in Wolof. Uh, 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 it should have every single language to be represented and then starting school with your mother tongue and introducing uh, uh, many as many languages as possible uh, uh, afterwards would be, I believe, the way to go. And if we have this Pan-African horizon in our linguistic policies in within each nation, 
we would make sure, for example, that among the languages introduced in, in uh, the classes in Senegal, Kiswahili is pre present because we, we precisely with that objective in, in mind. So we should be building uh, our linguistic policy uh, thinking of the ultimate goal of having, again, I uh, use that expression, our United States of Africa. Oh, I could keep on talking to you. Your 90 minutes just flies so quickly. I'm going to ask you to make your final comments, but also just share two last questions if you wanted to say something to this. Um, Daisy Okoiti is actually just really thinking with you, and she says, this is such a great conversation. And I am now just realizing I've been thinking of interpretation as translation and translation as interpretation. And she just wonders if you could just have brief comments, maybe one or two minutes on, on that. Um, and she said, do it at the end. So we're gonna do it at the end. Wahu uh, Mushiri Nganga, this is really a question that I think we will be carrying forward into some of our, our upcoming discussions. So if you just want to say something really tiny, because I know we will have time to go into this. Um, she, she notes that, you know, Professor Wangoi, you talked about the idea of going back in order to go forward. And indeed, we have come full circle because Mwani Mubashiri, you started off by taking us to where the name Africa came from. And she says, history clearly has a role to play in our Pan-African movement. We have covered that in a lot in detail in the first four conversations. But if any of you wants to, to comment on how you might position ancient Egypt in particular on the continental endeavor of Pan-Africanism, even as you as you wrap up, that would be really, really great. So, Wali Mwangwe, you want to go first? Yes, I think we have uh, a lot to discover as we are learning with the reparations movement of the objects that have been taken from our continent. So I think that um, ancient Egypt and ancient uh, great Zimbabwe and Benin and all our ancient knowledges, Timbuktu, should, we should go back to those antiquities and even the more modern cultures and languages. I think we have a lot to learn about them. I think the one thing about the return of the um, artifacts that people are asking for in reparation is that it will allow each culture that has lost its, uh, its um, earlier knowledge um, it will uh, bring it to life because orature has continued. I did want to talk and mention uh, this young woman called Sona Jobarte, who's one of the first African women Kora players. Uh, she's, from, uh, the she's from the Gambia, but this tradition of the Kora has been passed on to her for over 800 years. And we've seen with the manuscripts of Timbuktu, now, there were very many centers of learning and knowledge across the whole continent, and we haven't even started scratching the surface. But the good thing about Egypt is that it's intact. It's got its libraries, although the old library was burned, and there's hieroglyphics, and there's the pyramids, and there's lots of material that can be gathered. And it can lead us to the other things that we need to know. But I also think Oricha is a very important source of knowledge as well as our indigenous and our local and our traditional knowledges, because they're in science, then they're in agriculture, then all, all the, the fields. And we don't pay close attention to what is retained in the oral traditions and in the performative traditions. And some of us like here in Kenya, where we were totally muzzled, we actually don't see it. But if you go to West Africa, you will see that these cultures are still intact and living. So we need to learn a great deal about ourselves. So I think the, the, the recovery project, I call it the recovery project for me, is the most important one, as well as this project of translation. Because even the papyrus, we can now decipher them you know, just from fragments. So those fragments of objects and artifacts that we have, whatever is hidden, uh, and Professor Bashir will tell you there's so many objects from Africa in private collections in America, in every city, thousands and thousands of objects. Every time I've gone to ALA or ASA, we are taken to these places where these vaults are opened. And I remember that Professor uh, Kwame Dawes was asked to write poetry in just one, and he could only just open a few boxes 
Imagine if we made it our business to find where these objects are and bring them home as part of our healing, but also about looking and learning about who we were, rather than this nun person that started in the 19th century, which is how I learned my history and was shocked to realize from even the Western archives that the, the documentation, like the language that I sent to you, uh, Dr. Mshai, about the recording by the early missionaries of the data language was in 18 something. So there's so many contradictions that we need to unpack. So I'll stop here before I carry on. But I wanted to say one last thing, that public policy and national policy on languages and African policy on languages, if we're going to realize this African vision 2063, it has to be real and it has to be funded. It has to be resourced and personnel have to be trained. South Africa has led the way. They have a multiple language policy um, where everybody can speak their own uh, language and uh, do all their business in their language. So I think we need this um, at, led from the national and the African Union levels. Thank you. Thank you very, 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 very much, Professor Wangoi. Indeed, you remind us that this year is the African Union Year of Arts, Culture and Heritage, and that beyond what we just say, beyond the celebrations and affirmations, there's real policy work that needs to be done, that even as we get some work done, there's always enough work um, for many more people to join. And I really, really appreciate um, the, the thought and the care that you've given to making us think deeply about the question of translation, think deeply about the importance of our mother languages, think deeply about the policy work that needs to be done so that this wonderful, rich resource that we have can continue to be something that we really continue to work so well with in terms of the Pan-African struggle. Mwalimu Bashir. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the name Egypt came up uh, and Egypt is so important for Pan-Africanism, both in the past and in, in the future of Pan-Africanism as well. Uh, you know, one aspect of Pan-Africanism is to go against the, 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 the division created uh, by colonialism, not just the scramble for Africa uh, after the Berlin Conference, but even the way in which Africa was approached philosophically. I'm thinking here of uh, 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 this philosopher Hegel, the way in which he divided Africa, uh, uh, taking out of the continent Egypt, saying this is such a brilliant uh, civilization, it cannot belong really to this dark continent, so it has to be attached to Asia in one way. And then taking also the northern part of Africa because it was south of the Mediterranean Sea, which is considered the sea of civilization. So uh, uh, the Maghreb should not belong to Africa as well, but, but the only way it could be attached to Europe would be through colonialism. It cannot be uh, part of Europe. It just can be a colony of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe. And then for him, there was what he called Africa proper, which is uh, Africa south of, of Sahara, which is uh, uh, just a totally uh, uh, um, stereotypical and false image of the continent. And it was very important to remember Africa and that is the gesture of Pan-Africanism to make it whole again. And make it whole was to uh, um, uh, emphasize the importance of Egypt for Africa, even when it comes to the study, the scientific study of our languages, uh, uh, which we need still to be done. We are still uh, working with the classifications, the very quick classifications made by uh, uh, colonial uh, uh, ethno-linguistic, I, I, I believe, but probably our colleagues are working hard on uh, the scientific knowledge of our languages. And in that sense, the knowledge of ancient Egypt as demonstrated by uh, Sheikh Hunter Yop, who, who is really the one who, who restituted in a way uh, Egypt to Africa and Africa to Egypt. And that is a very important Pan-African uh, uh, gesture that we have to, to continue. And also in the present of Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan someone in the chat just mentioned, and this, is, this needs to be emphasized, the role played by Egypt in Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, uh, was uh, one of the most prominent voices of Pan-Africanism, uh, uh, and, and this needs to be emphasized. Now, just one last point on the difference between interpretation and translation. Very technical, obviously, 
but uh, I would say it is the, the difference between being simply an intermediary and being really a mediator. In other words, uh, colonial system, colonial administration wanted to create uh, interpreters. This was said apropos India very famously, uh, par Macaulay. It was also the case in, in Africa. You just train people to be interpreters. That is to say they are going to be the tools you use, the instruments by which you uh, uh, they transmit to you whatever it, you need to know in order to administer the colony and then they transmit your order to be executed. And the, the, the interpreters manage to turn themselves into true translators. In other words, they appropriated the language beyond just being uh, the tool or the instruments of the colonial administration and really were able to translate become translators, that is to say, translate their own African experience into the language itself. And the best example of what I'm saying is Amadou Hampateba, this uh, mm. uh, writer, sage uh, of, of West Africa, of Mali and Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal, I mean, the, all of Africa can claim him, uh, who, started his career just like an interpreter. He was supposed to, to, to go with the commandant de Cerc and transmit his orders and uh, tell him what the populations were saying. And he turned himself really into a mediator. In other words, he wrote about African culture, African traditions, African orature in, uh, in, in, in French, recreating them in French and in a way also recreating, the, appropriating the French language by inhabiting it with not only his experience, but also his own Fulani language and so on and so forth. So turning our, uh, someone from being an interpreter, a tool into a true mediator is also here the goal. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to end on this uh, praise of translation against simple interpretation. Walimu Bashir, it's always such a joy to talk to you. And you have reminded us of the importance of history and, and you know, warned us not to be afraid of this plural. Actually, it's a treasure that we have. We have such a treasure trove. And many other, other countries, other spaces in the world have lost that treasure. Um, as Wangoi told us, we are one of the spaces where everybody speaks at least one other language. And that is something not to be feared. It is something to be treasured. It is something for us to um, go in and explore even more. It's something for us to give as a gift to each other. Um, as uh, just going back, I'm just going to the, to the, to the comments and Munira uh, Chaleb talks about how both of you actually really have emphasized that it is so important um, the benefits of speaking another language um, that broadens our horizons, opens doors to a whole number of opportunities, allows us to travel into each other's spaces, I dare say, to join each other's struggles. And of course, um, thank you, Munira, for letting us know that you have edited the book in which my, The Gap, which Wangoi spoke about earlier, will be appearing. So thank you very much. I can only just, um, just grab a couple of chats, um, comments from the chat. Uh, on Onyekachi Wambu says, this is a really fascinating discussion and um, asks when recording will be available to share on our networks. If you go to the Alliance Frances live stream, that will remain up. So just go to Alliance Frances de Nairobi's um, YouTube channel, look for the playlist, Pan-African Forums. It is up already. You can share that. The elephant is also, if you go to the African forums under um, the elephant TV, you will see um, this will be coming up also shortly. So thank you very much for that. Um, I really, really want to thank both of you from the bottom of, your, of my heart. In, in 90 minutes, just showing us the breadth and the, 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 the depth of how much we, we, we have when we think about Pan-Africanism as languages, as a resource, as opposed to it being an obstacle. I want to thank our hosts, The Elephant, Ifra Nairobi and um, AF Nairobi, Alliance Francaise Nairobi, for making this space possible. I cannot thank enough the panelists and the, the participants. Um, the chat has been something else today and we will save your, your chats. We will look through them, we'll harvest some of your comments, some of your questions. This will help us to shape 
some of the coming um, conversations. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I see some very eminent um, um, people who work in language, you know, writers, translators, um, teachers have come in and I want to thank every single person who has joined us either on YouTube or, or in the Zoom webinar for coming and joining us. My name is Mishai Mwangola. It is always such a joy to hold the space for these kind of discussions. Wangoi, I was really excited to hear you bring up this question of gender because it so happened that our next African Forum, which will be on March 30th, is going to look at this exclusion or apparent exclusion of gender in the Pan-African um, spaces. Um, as you said, the discourse often happens as if Pan-Africanism is a male discourse and a space of liberation. I think both of you, Walimu, today illustrated, even in the names of the people you have cited, that Pan-Africanism is a space that welcomes everybody in it. But certainly, next month, we will be looking at how two liberation uh, movements, liberation struggles, liberation discourses of Pan-Africanism and feminism have um, engaged each other? Are they in opposition with each other? Or do they contradict each other? Do they complement each other? If you want to know this, please join us on March um, 30th at the same time when we will be continuing the Pan-African Forums. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Hello?